Welcome to my paint booth turned wood shop. As you can see, this place is in quite the state of disarray. Now that's because he's lazy. Yes, yes, that is true. But also because it's been too stinking hot in here. The only time I spend out here doing any real work is when it's nighttime or otherwise cool outside. And soon it's going to be winter, so it'll be too cold to work in here. And frankly, I'm tired of these problems. So today I'm going to solve these problems by installing this Pioneer Mini Split heat pump for my air conditioning and my heating. And I'm gonna show you how to install one as well. Full disclosure, Pioneer did not sponsor this video, but they did send me this 9,000 BTU unit at no cost. Anyway, on with the video. First things first, everything needs to be unpacked. Pioneer Mini Splits ship via freight on a pallet like you see here. There are three boxes, one for the refrigerant piping and ancillaries, one for the outside unit, and one for the inside unit. Make sure you check the outside unit's box for any accessories you may have ordered. The pallet consists of everything you see here, the box containing the refrigerant piping, the drain hose for the condensation off the indoor unit, some mountain screws, some extra flare nuts, a downspout connector for the condensation coming off the outside unit, remote batteries, some leak guard for the refrigerant piping, the indoor unit remote, the indoor unit remote holder, some paperwork, and of course, the indoor unit itself. Not pictured here is the outside unit because that's outside. Also contained in the refrigerant piping box, aside from the refrigerant piping itself, is the signal cable that goes from the inside to the outside unit, a protective pipe sleeve to put in the wall to insert your pipes and everything through. I'm gonna need a longer pipe than this. Some putty to seal up that hole in the wall and a very high quality condensation drain pipe. The first thing I decided to tackle was mounting the outside unit. I chose this location for mounting my unit because it's just on the other side of the wall from the indoor unit, which reduces the amount of piping I need. It's on the north side of the building, so it's never in direct sunlight. And there's a concrete slab below it on which to mount the unit solidly. One downside of this spot is that it's near my shop door, but the outside unit isn't very loud, so this doesn't bother me at all. Because the concrete below my unit was far from level, I chose to mount the unit on concrete blocks. I leveled up the concrete blocks by mounting them on a squishy base of quick-set mortar. The mortar base allowed me to make each block level and planar with the other block. It also gave the blocks a solid attachment to the concrete below them. Unfortunately, this mortar set in 15 minutes, which made me feel very rushed. There are several different options for mounting the outdoor unit. This is just the way that worked for me in this situation. For the two other mini splits on my shop, I mounted the outside units on wall mounts that are anchored to the concrete foundation. It's just whatever works best for you. All you have to do is make sure the unit is solidly affixed, level, and at least 12 inches away from the building, unless you're mounting them on a wall mount. It's pretty hard to get the unit 12 inches away from the wall it's mounted to. And once my blocks were leveled and mortared in place and the mortar had set, I bolted the unit down with some sleeve anchors. The next thing I tackled, because I was going in no particular order, was the wiring for the outside unit. First of all, I should note that I am not a trained electrician and I'm doing my own wiring at my own risk. I'm taking my life into my own hands, etc., etc. You can hire an electrician if you want, I'm not the boss of you. Anyway, the wiring to the outside unit is all you have to worry about. The only wiring for the inside unit is the signal cable that runs between the outside and inside unit. For the outside unit, I ran the power through an AC disconnect box as that's the standard thing to do. I don't know if it was strictly necessary, but I also chose a fused disconnect box. The fuses are rated at 15 amps because that's what my unit called for. Check your local laws for disconnect box fuse requirements. I mean, I didn't, but it seems like a good thing to say. My unit is 240 volts and calls for a 15 amp breaker, so I'll be using this two pole 15 amp breakers. But first, off with the Killy Zappy power. And on with the tiny pathetic LED light that I'll be using. Ugh. Now to turn everything on. I, of course, left the breaker to the unit off at this point to avoid an early death. I'll flip it on later when I want to actually turn on the unit. Now it's time to begin mounting the indoor unit. The mounting plate for the indoor unit comes pre-installed on the back of the unit. As you can see here, there is one 
little retaining screw that you have to take off before you can just unclip it. And then it just nicely unclips from the back and you can use this obviously to mount the indoor unit. Just mount this plate on the wall and then indoor unit will just slot into place. Mount the indoor unit anywhere you'd like. Just make sure the mounting bracket is level and the unit is at least six inches below the ceiling. I mounted mine arbitrarily in the middle of the room. And then I changed my mind and arbitrarily mounted it about a foot lower than before just because I felt like it looked a little bit better just a little bit lower. The next thing I want to do is connect the signal cable to the inside of this mini split. To snake the signal cables through to the front, you just go through the back here, right there. You just snake through the back. Connect everything up here. One end of the signal cable has pin connectors, the other has U-shaped connectors. The pin connector end is what goes into the indoor unit. And that's the signal cable connected to the indoor unit. Which color you match to which number doesn't matter as long as you match them in the exact same order on the outdoor unit. I'm going to be taking a picture of this so I remember when I go to wire up the outside unit. Right, next is the piping. You have three different ways to route the piping outside of the indoor unit. You can knock out this knockout over here and have the piping come straight out. You can have the piping come straight through the wall behind the unit, which is what I'm going to do. Or you can do the least recommended way, which is to knock out this knockout, bend the pipe a full 180 and have it come out this side of the unit. That way isn't highly recommended because it requires you to bend the pipe a full 180 and there's a bit of a risk of the pipe bending, breaking, or kinking in some way because you have to bend it so far over. Since I'm going to have my piping go straight back through the wall, I'm just going to bend that up and then wrap the drain hose and the signal cable all together so I can go ahead and mount the unit. Then it's time to drill the two and a half inch inside hole for the piping to fit through. To locate the outside hole, I'm just gonna be using this stupidly long aircraft drill bit. And because the outside hole needs to be lower than the inside hole, I'm gonna be drilling the center of the outside hole at the bottom of this inside hole. And the reason the outside hole needs to be lower is because the piping needs to go through the wall at a downward angle to allow for proper drainage from the air conditioner. Now to drill the outside hole using the pilot hole I just drilled with the aircraft drill bit as the center. To shield the pipes as they go through the wall, Pioneer provides you this little piece of plastic pipe with a nice little flange on the end. And this works just fine, but it's too short for the thickness of my wall, so I'm not going to be using it. Instead, I'm going to be using this bit of Schedule 40 electrical conduit that I cut down to size that fits perfectly in the hole and reaches to the other side. It even has this nice bit of flare on the end to get, keep it from being pushed through the wall as I'm shoving pipes into it. Unfortunately, the foam insulation tape I bundled everything together with had too much friction inside the pipe, causing it to get jammed in there, so I had to take it all off. Now everything slides freely. Ta-da! Is up. With the indoor unit piping routed outside, the next thing I want to do is connect the signal cable and the line power to the outdoor unit. Again, when connecting the signal cable, make sure to match the color and number the exact same way you did on the indoor unit. In my case, I did red, green, white, black, although I see that green was quite obviously supposed to be the ground cable. It doesn't, too, doesn't matter too much. As long as I get it matched to the indoor unit, nothing matters. And the black line on the signal cable I have as my ground. L1 and L2 here are just the two line wires. If this was a 110 unit, it would be the line and neutral wires. Easy enough. And lastly, put the strain relief back into place. Because I'm procrastinating connecting the scary refrigerant hoses, I'm going to go ahead and connect the drain pipe for condensation out of the air conditioner. The next step is, finally, to connect the refrigerant piping. The first step is to take the end caps off the refrigerant lines coming out of the indoor unit. Now, don't be alarmed when it hisses. The indoor unit does come shipped pre-charged with nitrogen, so it will make a Russian air rushing sound when you take these end caps off. Scared me the first time, that's for sure. I thought I'd done something bad. And since the lines are pressurized with nitrogen, the end caps can and will pop off when you unscrew them. It isn't necessary, but I stood off to the side when unscrewing the end caps so they wouldn't hit me when they flew off. They don't hurt, I'm just easily startled. Yep, there we go. 
Now that the pressure is gone, let's just take this other end cap off and be less jumpy because there's not going to be any pressure to make it pop off at me. Now that we're out here, you can see why I wanted the refrigerant pipes to come straight out the back of the indoor unit. It's so I can mount the refrigerant pipes, screw them in place outside as opposed to connecting the refrigerant pipes to the unit before mounting it to the wall. The alternative would have been to connect the refrigerant pipes to the unit before mounting the indoor unit to the wall. So you have to finagle this hose through the wall while you're holding the indoor unit and it's just a massive pain. I had to do that with my two other mini splits that I mounted in my shop and it was just a massive pain. This is much easier. Another pipe connection option is to mount the indoor unit to the wall and then drive a wedge behind it like it illustrates in the manual. This allows you to connect the piping to the back of it while it's mounted to the wall. But this method is not ideal as you have to work up and under the unit and tighten the pipe fittings in a very small space. Really just pick whatever method works best for you in your situation. Now take the end caps off of refrigerant piping. We can connect this to that. This is exciting. Now before connecting the pipes I need to apply the supplied leak guard to the flare connections. This doesn't want to cut at all. Just take a little bit of it and rub it on the mating surface of the copper flare. This is where I am admittedly doing things slightly incorrectly. You're supposed to use a torque wrench on these flare connections to make sure you torque them down to the proper spec. Unfortunately, that requires an open end adapter to the torque wrench that I don't possess. Now there is a risk of over tightening it and there's also a risk of under tightening it with this by feel method. And I have actually under tightened a flare fitting before when installing a Pioneer unit, which caused a $500 recharge fee when all of the refrigerant leaked out of it. So do this at your own risk. It'd be easier to get an open end attachment to a torque wrench, but I'm short sighted and I forgot to do that. And I connect the refrigerant hose on the bottom on the outside unit. It is worth noting that you could just hire an HVAC guy to do this stuff for you. And I'm doing it myself for wanting to show you how to do it, but also because I'm cheap. And again, I need to apply a leak guard to the mating surfaces. Smear that around. Connect the bits together. Uh, get everything good and smashed down. Make sure to brace the valve body here. Another wrench. Again, I should be using a torque wrench here, but I'm not. Do as I say, not as I do, etc., etc. <sighs> Click. My blood vessels started popping out, so that's my uh, torque setting, I guess. Now for the fun part, drawing the vacuum on these lines to release the refrigerant into the indoor unit. The outdoor unit comes pre-charged. All you have to do really is release the refrigerant into the lines and into the indoor unit. But first you have to draw a vacuum on it, and this step always makes me nervous. So I'm going to follow the instructions verbatim and just take you along with me. For the pipe evacuation step, you'll need a vacuum pump and manifold gauge made for R410A and a 5 16 to 1 quarter inch service port adapter for connecting the manifold gauge to the unit. I'll provide Amazon links in the description to the tools I'm using. Connect the blue low side hose of the manifold gauge to the service port on the outdoor unit's gas side valve. And the gas side is the large diameter, so the lower one here. Now it's important to note that this operates via a Schrader valve here, so you just have to connect it really quickly to prevent any refrigerant, excess refrigerant from leaking out. Some will leak out when you connect this. Nope, I'm an idiot. What I meant to say was some refrigerant will leak out when you disconnect this fitting. No refrigerant leaks out when you first connect it because there isn't any refrigerant in the lines yet. That's what this whole step is about, is putting refrigerant in the lines. Connect the yellow middle hose from the manifold gauge to the vacuum pump. Open the blue low pressure valve of the manifold gauge. Keep the red high pressure valve closed. Turn the vacuum pump on to start evacuating the air from the line set and indoor unit circuits. Run the vacuum pump for at least 15 minutes. All right. I will now use this 15 minutes to contemplate the meaning of life. All right, the 15 minutes is up. I do not yet know what the meaning of life is, but I do know what this next step is, and that's to close the blue side of the manifold gauge and turn the vacuum pump off. And the next step is equally exciting. Wait for five minutes, then check that there has been no rise in the low pressure gauge reading. So more waiting. All right, five minutes is up, and that needle has not moved at all. So more than likely, 
there is no leak. So I can move on to the next step. Unscrew the cap from the liquid side service valve, which is the small diameter one. So unscrew the cap. Then insert a hexagonal wrench into the service valve liquid side, which is the small diameter one, and open the valve by turning the wrench a one quarter in a one quarter counterclockwise turn. Listen for the sound of gas exiting the system, then close the valve after five seconds. This is another leak check step. Open it by a quarter turn for five seconds. You can't hear it on camera here, but you can definitely hear the sound of refrigerant rushing into the lines during this step. Four, five, and close. Now, I just need to watch the manifold gauge, which has now risen to a positive pressure for a few minutes to make sure that it's not leaking out. If you have one of those refrigerant leak sniffer tools, now would be the time to use it to check for leaks. Alternatively, you can also use soapy water on the connections to check for leaks. I didn't do either one of these things, but pretend I did. If you do happen to find a leak, refer to your manual and panic. While I'm waiting for that, I'm going to go ahead and connect the drain downspout to the bottom of the outdoor unit because I forgot to do it earlier. I'm just going to take a section of the drain hose from the indoor unit off. Go ahead and stick this with the rubber seal underneath the outside unit if I can find the port. There it is. Downspout is connecticated. Only use this drain connector if your unit is elevated off the slab or mounted on a wall. All right, it's been a few minutes, and has that needle gone down at all? Let me check the reference photo I took. Looks like it's right on the money of where it was before. So I'm gonna go ahead and say it's not leaking. Using a hexagonal wrench, fully open both the liquid and gas pressure valves. Remove the charge hose from the service port and tighten the valve caps on all three valves. Open up this one first, all the way. And then open up the gas side. Now, let's disconnect the service hose. And again, some refrigerant will leak out of this because it's a Schrader valve. Just have to do it real quickly. That was far from quick and I may have burned my hand slightly. Right, let's examine what I did wrong here. First of all, I screwed the manifold connection on too far. This meant I had to spend more time unscrewing it, which allowed more refrigerant to escape than was necessary. Secondly, I should have worn gloves. Like I said, some refrigerant will always escape during the step, so I should have been wearing gloves to begin with. Refrigerant mishap out of the way. It's time to flip the breaker on and try this puppy out. Flipping the breaker now. Let's turn it on. Ah. Uh, now this is a 9,000 BTU unit, so it's incredibly quiet when it's on. Let's turn down the air conditioning mode. Let's turn it way down to 65, something ridiculous. And if I didn't already mention it, this doubles as a heater. It's a reversible heat pump, so it does heating and cooling, which is very exciting. Yeah, that's, that's cold. That's proper cold now. That's awesome. I have an air conditioner. <laughs> the very last thing I did was clamp down all of the pipes and connections running to the outdoor unit to keep them from flopping around in the breeze. And then I jammed some of that supplied putty into the end of the pipe hole to keep it sealed up. And that's it. It's installed and running. And listen to how loud it isn't. And that's what the fan turned to max. This is how loud it is at its loudest. It's another run, one of the reasons I love these units. It's because they're so daggum quiet. Also, I tested it. I turned the temperature all the way down to test the air conditioner. I let it run like that for about 15 minutes. And then I cranked the temperature all the way up to test the heat. And it pumped out some pretty good heat. This thing works supremely well. And I didn't screw up the installation this time if you should have any installation questions that weren't answered by this video don't hesitate to call pioneer support line because it is excellent i used it myself when i installed my first pioneer mini split when some questions arose and they answered all of my questions with ease they really know what they're talking about and they have very good communication skills they were even too nice to tell me that my questions were stupid so that's it my wood shop is now climate controlled i can now spend long periods of time out here at a comfortable set temperature no matter what it's doing outside Maybe I can actually start getting some things done now. It's just too bad I'm still lazy. Oh well, thank you for watching.